us pick up uh, in this session with Professor Ajiti Nathkarni from uh, IIT Bangalore. And uh, the title is slightly different from what you see in the abstracts that was given. And it's the great title. No, no, no. Oh. oh, that is the title. Oh, I see, I see. Okay. Canvas ideas on major and integral. Okay, that's it. Has himself uh, written so many books for including this one uh, with uh, Atreya, and which I'm going to mention now because it just comes in very handy for me. Because it's a book on major and probability. So he deals beginning with Kara uh, Theodori extension and then Han Kolmogorov uh, method of getting measure, which means you have a set. You have a collection of subsets of X, which is closed under complements and finite unions. And then that, you have a finitely additive function. Then, if that is countably additive in the sense in which we all know, if a set in that collection is a countable pairwise disjoint union of sets from that set, then measures add. Okay, and for and that gives you an outer measure and then you can extend that. He has done all that, very good. And then there is section 1.6 Lebesgue measure. You don't need that, you can continue with, you know, you have outer measure, measure space, and continue with that. And apparently, Sachs' book doesn't do Lebesgue measure. He deals with Lebesgue measure, but doesn't prove anything about Lebesgue measure. But and Sachs was, their book on major theory was translated by L.C. Young. And uh, he was teaching us real variables. And he told us a lacuna in that book. He said that was a big mistake in that book. That means he starts with abstract major theory right in the beginning. And he even said in the class that all that is in Helmos is in the first two chapters of this book or something like that. But then he also confessed that there is a big mistake in this because I have not given a single model for this setup. So why does, why does it do it in the back measure? Because he has to give a model, you know, otherwise that whole thing, first section is of no use. Now in, the, in that process of that model, he proves the following. The very first thing he proves is the following. Let me say that, the way he does it. He means uh, 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 Joel, uh, our our guest Sundar and is Atreya. Okay, I'm going to state that theorem now. Okay. Lemma 1.6 point, not lemma 1.6 point three. Yeah, yeah, lemma 1.6 point three. Okay. Hmm. Interval A, B, okay. It is open at one end, that doesn't matter is contained in union of A and B n. Then B minus A is less than or equal to summation n equal to 1 to infinity B n minus A n. Well, why does he have to prove all this? Because after all, measure is monotone. What is huh? Dn minus An. Right? Okay. Because after all, measure is monotone, so this is less than that. And it is countably additive, that is also proved. So this is less than summation Bn minus n. Why do you prove that? Special, no, you don't need any effort. You know, well, now think of this very thing, but don't think on the real line. Take only the rationals. This thing still makes sense, but it is not true. Okay, this is fails for rationals. So this is a key fact that gives a model for a non-trivial model for a major, major theory, and that means set x, sigma algebra, and, okay? And this is proved by using Heinebergel theorem, starting with Borel. Okay, 
Now let me see how Cantor comes in here. Cantor's main aim was to look at sets and their derived sets. So take a set X, derive set in a set of limit points, and so you don't mind, you know, let us take a closed set, doesn't matter, because otherwise, and then to keep on taking limit points, and you take the intersection, keep on doing that, and after, uh, you know, if you have a countable number, take the intersection and start all over again. So that is how we discovered the first uncountable ordinal. So we do it, if at some countable ordinal, that process will stop. And you will get either an empty set or a perfect set, then, then it will, that perfect set will continue. And then he was interested in cardinality of that set. Okay, perfect set. It's not just Cantor set that the Cantor ternary set, which books, all books give that set, but nothing more than that. And in that process, to prove that, the very first thing he proves is the following. Let me just, uh, I can go on my, okay. So this is about perfect sets, which I just want to say. Very first thing, look, I'm there, I want to emphasize that point. First term in this direction is the following. He is now interested in the, you see, cardinality doesn't distinguish between uh, different kind of uh, sets, but now he wants to be metrical properties of the set. So let us see. This is in 1883. Linear means a subset of the interval. If a set P subset is such that is derived set is countable, then it is always possible to put P inside union of intervals with sum of intervals lengths arbitrarily small. This is exactly what you said. And see my title of this uh, section. I'm saying here, Cantor's answer to an undergraduate exam question in Riemann integration theory. And you know, in, when I was a student at least, we used to look at many different papers from many different universities, including Madras University to see what kind of questions they ask, et cetera. They, then there will be, in the library, there would be a book by Madras in the question papers. And then Riemann integration, if there are finitely many discrete Riemann integrable, if you more, more sophisticated, this is some kind of sophisticated question in that setting. If the set of <laughs> derived set is countable, then the set of whole set can be enclosed in finitely many intervals of arbitrary small lengths. That means if the set of discontinuities is of that type, then the function is Riemann integrable. So I'm, that's why I'm putting it in that way. And there were very good mathematicians at that time in Madras, and they were fond of asking these questions. Even nowadays, top mathematicians don't set questions, but why the Nathu Swami and all these people did set questions for MSc and BSc. You may not know it, but I think they did. I'm sure about that. And they were proud of what they did in those days. I think I have to close that now. Now, of course, to prove that, now how, what has it to do with what I said just now? Oh. <laughs> One more. Okay. okay, now what has it to do with what I said just now? And uh, let me secret out, because that theorem doesn't seem to have anything to do with what I have said. But see, and this realization came to me, I gave a talk on this kind of, uh, this precisely in this paper, but an earlier version, when I didn't, didn't know this, and I was going to give a talk at IIT Madras, and in fact, this work was done here, this is an expositor talk, like for a book paper. And I was coming from IIT after giving a talk and coming to IMSC and at that intersection when I was crossing, suddenly realized that he has proved what a very basic fact. Because take any set, suppose now I have an interval and it is a closed set because complement is open if I remove these endpoints. So it is a countable closed set, so derived set is uh, derived set is uh, countable, okay. There are, and therefore, some of the lengths of those intervals is one. That will come out from the proof here. Okay, so let us go through the, go, go, uh, let me go through the proof now, quickly. So, and thing without loss of the related AB is equal to zero, 01, and since P prime, P prime is countable, so is P. And Q, hence Q, P union P prime is also countable. So we have R equal to 0, 01 equal to Q union R where R is 0, 01 minus P. All right, that's, R is not so important here, I think. So we enumerate Q as U1, U2, U3, et cetera. That means the closure of, closure of P is enumerated as U1, U2, U3. Since Q is closed, R is open, okay? Complement is open. 
And therefore, it is union of finite, finite or countable of pairwise disjoint open intervals, C nu, D nu, nu equal to 1, 2, 3, etc. Where C nu and R a D nu, okay, uh, belong to Q, or, okay, where C nu belong to Q. But not every point in, okay, in Q is necessarily a C nu or a D nu, since a point in Q may be a limit point of P. All right. So the C nu, D nu, not all of them may be in Q. The length of the interval C nu, D nu is D nu minus C nu. Okay, and this length is called, uh, you know, the sum of the lengths of the intervals is call it sigma, that is his notation, Cantor's notation, nu equal to 1 to infinity, d nu minus c nu. He just writes this sum, okay, but doesn't give any name to this sum like volume or length or anything like that. Although interval has a length, their length word is used there. Clearly sigma is less than or equal to 1, that is easy to see, because all finite sums will be less than or equal to 1, therefore. We will show that sigma is equal to 1. That's what he will show. That means countable additive of interval length over interval, which is same is, is what uh, Sundar and they prove. And every single book on measure theory has to prove that they prove it by his uh, by uh, Borel's method. But look at his method. So possibility of sigma less than one is eliminated. To this end, okay, we define a function f on zero to one as follows. Okay. Okay. So. Fx is the sum of the lengths of the interval C nu D nu which lie to the left of x. And if x belongs to an interval, you take only up to C lambda up to x. Okay, that's it. Not the all C lambda. It's clear how it's a kind of a distribution function, but all the uh, sum of the all lengths of intervals less than x, and if x belongs to some interval, you take up to that. That means x minus C lambda. Okay, f is continuous. Okay, and from the definition, and this also gives reason for its continuity check that fx plus h minus fx is less than or equal to h. In particular, if x and x plus h belong to the one same interval c lambda d lambda, then fx plus h minus fx is equal to actually equal to h. And so x plus h minus uh, fx plus h, okay, for those points where x and x plus h belong to that interval is x minus fx. Okay, x plus h minus f x plus h is x minus f x. That is clear. <coughs> then, so we consider the function phi x x minus f x. It is continuous in zero one, assumes value zero at zero because f assumes value at zero, and phi of one is one minus sigma because f of one is sigma. Sigma, remember, is sum of the lengths of the interval, and you want to prove that equal to one. Also, phi is constant on intervals c nu d nu. That is, we have seen just now, because x uh, plus h minus x equal to fx plus h minus. So because of that, phi is constant on intervals. Just think about it. Uh, let me not, let us not spend time on that. So very interesting now. Phi is constant on intervals c nu d nu, and phi one is zero. Phi zero is zero, and phi one is one minus sigma. Now, before starting the proof. He has an Hilfsatz, which is a lemma. In German, they call it Hilfsatz. And that is the intermediate value theorem. Okay, so he's now going to use the intermediate value theorem. So, if this function phi, uh, okay, so we have this function phi, which is con constant on those intervals. Let us see now. All right. Yes. Okay. All right. So now, how many intervals are there? There are uncountable number of intervals. And how many of endpoints? They are also countable. So what is the set of values taken by phi? Phi takes countable number of distinct values because countable number of values really those one on, ones on the intervals were constants, and on the endpoints they are countable many. On the other hand, phi of one is phi of 0 is 0 and phi of 1 is 1 minus sigma. If sigma were strictly less than 1, phi would be taking all the values between 0 and 1 minus sigma, which is a count countable number of them. He has proved that, that the, you know, that the uh, uncountable many points in 0 in an interval. So that's a contradiction. And so we have uh, phi, uh, phi 1 also equal to 0. It's a constant. Phi is a constant and that has to be 0, which means phi of uh, f of 1 is 1. Okay. 
phi of zero equal to zero, phi of one equal to one means f of uh, one equal to one. That means sum of the lengths of the intervals is equal to the interval zero one. So that is how he proved it. So he proved it nearly 14 years before, but, but it is never recognized. And uh, uh, I looked at uh, Borel, there is no, uh, because you don't see it. The way he has put it, you don't see that he has proved that thing. If you know this DR said, etc., but he has proved this. But now, let us go a little further. Okay, so that is how he has proved. Okay. Now, it is important not to forget this proof because one year later he proves the same thing, slightly general. He says that take any closed set, for that matter, and he wants a perfect set, but take any closed bounded set. And suppose it is contained in the interval 0 to 1. So you have the complementary intervals and you take the sum of the lengths of the complementary intervals. Take any closed set in the interval 0 to 1 and take the sum of the lengths of the complementary intervals and call it sigma. Okay. Then he shows the following essentially that, uh, I'll just say what that is. Okay. Then given any epsilon, he, that is, uh, is, essentially is proving that any closed set has, is, uh, any closed bounded set is outer limit measurable. Because 1 minus sigma is its, uh, you know, its uh, limit measure by its outer in, inner measure because the closed set, 1 minus sigma is its inner measure. And he says, given any epsilon, we can find finitely many intervals covering P union P prime. So let us take closed set, P union P prime, don't worry about P union P prime. Says that some of the lengths of their intervals is less than 1 minus sigma plus epsilon. In the case on hand, sigma was. One, but if, if we don't assume that, you know, I'm not assuming now that this closed sets are set of points of the derived set is uh, countable or anything like that. So for any perfect set, so you are not looking at only, you know, perfect sets with uh, zero measure or anything like that, like anti-Turner set. He had in mind all kinds of sets. And he uses this also to, uh, to settle the cardinality questions. Okay, so this is, he proved, in other words, he also proved that all closed sets are Lebesgue measurable. Again, many, many years, um, not many, but at least 14, 15 years before. All this thing is not, uh, you know. Uh, now, he had a notion of uh, measure, which for, again, bounded closed sets agrees with the uh, Lebesgue measure, OK? OK, before that, let us understand this very clearly. You have these functions, fx plus h minus fx less than or equal to h. Phi x plus h minus phi x is less than or equal to h. Okay. So he has already done something for Lebesgue to answer. My hunch is that Lebesgue and Borel internalized, or nowadays they use uh, internalized, but assimilated Cantor's work so very well that uh, they were not able to distinguish between what is their own and what is Cantor's. So this is a nice fact. So that means your function f satisfies Lipschitz condition with constant one. And if a function satisfies Lipschitz condition, what is the next question? Is it differentiable? And that was, of course, I suggest the question phi x plus h minus phi x limit whether this exists. Answer to which is given by the celebrated Lebesgue density theorem, which is a mathematical way of expressing. In other words, I want to say that this may have motivated Lebesgue to you know, investigate that thing. Now, uh, interestingly, you also note that although Cantor calls the numbers d nu minus c nu, size of the gross of the interval c nu minus d nu, and he writes down these sums summation n nu equal to 1 to in the d nu minus nu, uh, sizes of interval gross n, pairwise disjoint, okay. He does not use this to define the size of the gross, this interval. So open sets with countably many intervals, he doesn't want to define length of that. It was Borel who take that major step, took that major step, hmm? okay. Now why do you, uh, one may speculate that this is because such sets uh, can be much more complicated than finite union of intervals. Indeed, one can have situations where some of the lengths of the intervals is less than epsilon, where the closure of the union is the whole interval. So I think this must have bothered them quite a bit. And they hesitate to call, OK. But uh, Libeck said that, well, we'll take it as a, uh, no, Borel. Borel said that we'll take it as a, uh, and this is what, I'm proud of this sentence. 
Let us also not fail to notice, although Borel, Lebeck, and even Zermelo do not seem to have not noticed it, that the above theorem, proved with very small preamble and no epilogue, contains the key fact needed in measure theory, namely countable additive of interval lengths over intervals. And then I give the reason which I already given just now. Okay. Now, volume, this is, so he, he gives three different names, volume, inert, and grandiose, so he doesn't want to miss people in England and uh, France from uh, his definition. So let us see how Cantor defines, and he has, he thought, he must have thought this very important because he wrote only one or two papers in French in Acta Mathematica, what he had already done in German, for this for, for, for part is also in uh, German paper and also in Acta Mathematica, where it is correspondence with the editor, okay. Let us see how Cantor defines the metrical size of a set in Rn. He doesn't, we have discussed up, up, uh, above only R, but he does it in Rn. It is understood that we know how to calculate the volume of a ball or a cube in Rn. And the finite union of such sets. Cantor defines for any bounded set P in R, Rn, the volume of P as follows, okay. Fix row positive, again there is a criticism, but there is no, you know, there is no room for criticism here. People criticize this as, you know, you need Hanover theorem or anything like that, nothing like that. Fix row positive and let K X row denote the sphere of radius rho with center x in P union P prime, okay. So let us step on the closed sets. Otherwise, you will have some difficulty. So, P union P prime. So, let us assume that P is closed. Denote the union X in P union P prime, K X rho, okay, of these spheres by M rho P, okay. They don't mind spending a lot of space in those days. So, M rho P in Rn. So, he is using Rn and this, this is how his symbol is. Or simply by M rho P, if you know Rn in mind, if you already have an N in mind, okay. Cantor says that M rho P is a set whose volume may be determined by usual method of multiple integration. Now his union may be, you know, infinite union and all that, that criticism will be there. But let us not do that here because rho is fixed and your set is bounded in close. So if rho is fixed without using Hanover theorem, you can cover it with finitely many uh, balls or rectangles. So that is no criticism. One may object to this since it is not clear that M P rho is a finite in our balls, but this objection can be easily met as follows. Since rho is fixed and p is bounded, it is clear without using high number of theorem that finitely many k rho p are enough to cover p union p prime. And we may replace m p rho by the finite union. Now write this function now, f rho p union r exactly the way he writes. And that means the volume of that uh, such a set, okay. All right, and that equals, and the tech limit as rho goes to zero, and then I P R N, that is I P. It is really what I what I want to say is that it is nothing but the what is called order, uh, outer Jordan content. So, Cantor's inert volume, etc., of bounded sets is the outer Jordan content. That's all there is to it. Okay. Now, Cantor emphasizes here. Now, again, something trivial for us, but there is some. Cantor emphasizes through the choice of notation and in words that IP very much depends on the size of the, you know, number n, the, the dimension of the space Rn in which P is considered to be embedded. And then he mentions in that French book, a uh, French paper, thus for a unit sphere S in R2, unit square S in R2, when you regard it as a subset of R3, the inert is zero and when you subtract R, uh, of R3, it is zero, and when you think of it as a subset in R2, it is one. The positivity of IP tells us something about the dimension of the space in which P is embedded. Now again, this is trivial. This may seem like a trivial remark, but we must remember that the question, what is the dimension of a set, was an unresolved foundational question when Cantor was writing. And he had already proved that notion of cardinality failed to distinguish between sets of different di dimensions. On the other hand, positivity of this inert IP Rn implied that while P is a subset of Rn, P cannot be contained in a smaller dimensional subspace. Then these are my own remarks. The question of dimension mentioned above was resolved only in the early part of last century through the speculative writings of Poincaré and the work of Brouwer, Lebeck, Urizon, Alexandrov, and Hausdorff. Hausdorff was a set theorist. We all know that he has written a 
wrote a book on set theory. And it is natural to wonder if Cantor's remarks stimulated him to define his p dimensional measure and associated dimension. Okay. So let us proceed now. Okay. So his inert is not additive really because he for, for his inert of a p is also same as his closure. So it's not additive unless the sets are well separated. Okay. Okay. But he proves the following that inert of a set is the, the, the is the is that of the final set, you know, you take this, I say that every closed set, if you keep on taking derived sets, ultimately you get the uh, perfect set. So we are dropping these countable sets every time. But in doing that, we are not changing the inert. The volume remains the same. You know, the outer jargon content of a set is equal to the outer jargon content of the largest perfect set lying in the closure of that set. That is what it proves. It's not altogether easy to do that. So this is what they, what it does. Okay, now you think that Cantor's term is fun. He had a very, very nice, you know, he described in some sense all measures on the real line, in some sense. Especially those measures which have their support on a given fixed perfect set. How did he perfect nowhere dense set? Let us say perfect nowhere dense set. I, will, I think I will do that and then maybe if there is time I will continue. Okay, so take the real line and I take a perfect nowhere dense set. They came into discussion just when uh, so Krishna was giving his talk. And there was very nice result there that there are absolutely continuous measures sitting on a perfect nowhere dense set. Or it is nowhere dense set. And of course, if I, if it is, then it has to be, have a perfect component in it. So it's a very interesting result. But let us see how Panther uh, got measures on them. So first of all, if you have a countable set, and suppose it is ordered, and suppose order is of the ra like the rationals. There is no largest element and no smallest element. And between any two elements, there is a third one. Suppose there is a countable set like that. And there are two such countable sets, then they are order isomorphic. You can set up a one-to-one -one map between the two so that order is preserved. So this is one thing he proves. Now let us take a perfect nowhere dense set. And if you have perfect nowhere dense set, there are these complementary intervals. And suppose the endpoints are not there, you know, perfect nowhere, in an open set you take a uh, perfect nowhere dense set. If that happens, then between any two intervals, there is a third interval because it is nowhere dense. Between any two inter complement inter it there is an interval, okay? And there is no first element and the last, last element because I have dropped the endpoints. So these intervals can, are countable in number and they can be order in exactly the same way the rationals are order, same kind of rationals, so they are order isomorphic. So now we say, he doesn't have to stick to rationals. He says take any countable dense set in the real line, having same, you know, like that. And then set up a one-to-one -one map between these intervals and this order preserving map. Okay. So on, there is an interval here and there is a real number from this countable dense set associated with that and order preserving. So if the two intervals are uh, different, the, their values are different and it is increasing because the order on the real line is increasing. So we have defined a function on these intervals and it extends continuously to the whole of the unit interval. So you have got a function which is continuous. So this is much better than Cantor function. It is very general. It should be given in any textbook. It is very easy. I can, you know, Cantor you have to say oh, this is ternary set and you have to ternary expansion and binary expansion and this and that and that. This is very general. And, and then he, of course, he, he does that, then he gives that as a special case. And we people have, we have picked up only the special case. So, uh, so in other words, since you, you can have this arbitrary uh, countable dense set, it means he described all strictly increasing functions continuous with points of increase in any perfect subset of the uh, real line, which is as good as giving all the measures whose support lies in the perfect set. Okay. So, 
So there are so many things which are in Cantor which are you know, uh, not mentioned in any of the books. What is the time? Eight, eight minutes I have. Okay, good, and then I'll finish. Okay, so now I want to do something. This is inert, as I said, it's, he takes the closure of a set and then covers it with that. So his closure of a set and a set, they are the same in R. So that is a defect. But the, looked at it differently, it is not that much of a defect. You know, I'll just, this is a bit of a hyperbole I'm adding to all this. Okay. Now, the Panther also we find an integral, very nice. Let me get that out. Okay. So, Cantor also define integral over an arbitrary set, not just the intervals, okay? You can have a Riemann integral function, you can integrate on an interval, but he defined it on, so let us say how, so basically on a closed set, okay? For closed sets, for functions, he had in mind. With the, so it agrees with the Lebesgue integral. So in this, you know, if you give me uh, Lucy's theorem, one can develop Riemann, the Lebesgue integration to, with this theorem. If phi is an arbitrary, and he has the word absolutely in italics, absolutely integral function of his time in Rn, and P is an arbitrary bounded set in Rn, okay? Then he, what he does is, he covers that set with finitely many, you know, spheres or rectangles of radius rho, and integrates over those, uh, union of those finitely many, and lets rho go to zero, okay? Let rho go to zero, and that is his integral. See, m, m rho p we have just now defined. It's finitely many uh, spheres of radius so which cover p. And integrate the function phi over that set and let rho go to zero. That is basically the Lima, Riemann integral over that set, okay? If phi is identically one function, we will get the, the inert of his, okay? So, so for closed sets, more generally for any set with, hmm, okay, so that is how we define. So Cantor, but it is quite, you know, for example, now I have, suppose I have a closed set and a continuous function on that. I can always extend it to the whole real line with compact support. That's easily done. An undergraduate can do that. So he has defined integral of a continuous function on any closed set. And with Lucene's theorem, you can proceed and you know, develop the theory of human integration theory. Uh, so, but, and another thing about those guys, he just defines this, doesn't put this anything into any use. So it goes to say something about the, Today, I think editor would have said, what's the use of this? You're just making a definition and not doing anything with it. But uh, I think in those days, they didn't mind. Just a definition and nothing doing with it. Cantor does not put integral to use or derive any of the properties. But in the definition, the word absolutely appears in italics. And this is a bit hyperbole I'm adding. And so one may wonder if Cantor had some deep feeling that successful theory of integrals will integrate only those functions whose absolute values are integrable, okay? Now finally, his IP is called IP bar, that is a fact, and that makes non-additivity, unless the, your sets are separated by positive distance. So that is a defect, but is it really a defect, okay? Viewed differently, it encodes a deep major theoretic phenomena connecting finitely additive measures with countably additive measures. So let me see, if you have time, four minutes, I'll just show how that is. So think of an interval a, b, I have written like this, of rationals, okay? Take a, b with this new kind of brackets of only rationals, and take a continuous function on that, which is uniformly continuous on rationals, okay? Then integral of f over the rationals is equal to integral over the unit interval of the extension, okay? So the inert of the closure is the Lebesgue measure of the interval. Okay, or rather, yeah, B minus. Okay, now let me go to the. So let us take similarly. Suppose I take little Hilbert square little l two, and on R n in that little l two, I have this measure. Okay. This measure will not extend to l two. It will get you know. I'm just be trying to say something. So this you will get project to limit which will be only finitely additive. On, on finite dimensional spaces, it is ca uh, countably additive, this uh, Gaussian measure, but over L2, it is not. But then we know 
that you can enclose it in a bigger Banach space where the finite value measure LP is equal to measure of its closure. Okay. And similarly, you can give many examples where you have finite value uh, measure and you can embed it. So if I take, take a set, then in embedded thing, there is a corresponding set which has the same measure, but that is a countable value to measure. Okay. In other words, let me finally go. This is a bit of an hyperbole to see that maybe he was in touch with some kind of a cosmic intelligence and trying to say wh or whatever he can. So I'll just read the final thing and then stop. Thus, this, the, the deep phenomena that property IP equal to IP closure of Cantor's inert and course may be stated as follows. If there is a finite value to measure on a certain algebra of subsets of a set X, then with good chance there is a completion or compactification Y of X in which X is densely embedded and Y admits a countable value to measure M such that lambda of A, lambda is finite relative is M of the closure of A in the bigger space. How is it related to the measure of scope check compatibility? Uh, what is that? I don't know whether it is that or that. It's, I don't know how to think about that. I'm just thinking of, uh, I don't know why. Okay. Finally, I think this, this is. I am comparing Jordan's content and Jordan content. Okay. It's okay, I think I will stop here. Outer Jordan content, so you, you know, they, what they said was if Jordan had an inner Jordan content, outer Jordan content, and Jordan, Jordan measurable sets, Jordan sets with Jordan content, that kind of distracted. People said, oh, this is nice, it is additive, etc., etc. The entire thing was not even additive. But it restricted the class of sets tremendously. You see, those, those Cantor was interested in having sets with Jordan uh, content, uh, outer content positive and inner content zero, they were very much of interest to him. But Jordan made them uninteresting. And then Lebeck came and he had the combined uh, no, Cantor's ideas and, but uh, it was not, many people knew uh, Jordan's thing, which is because he is nice mathematically. But uh, Cantor had lots, so many more things to say. I think I'll stop here.